Welcome to today's webinar by the Australian Water School and Ice Warm. We're so glad you could join us. It's going to be an interesting time together. We're delighted to have Andy Lucas and Ben Keel also joining us. My name's Trevor Piller. I'm the National Partnerships Manager here at Ice Warm, and I am so amazed to see how many people, the numbers are still going up, I see on my screen here. So uh, thank you for joining us today. Many uh, uh, who I know, many, many I don't know in fact, but uh, we're so delighted you can join us. Look at this, all over Australia, India, yep, Europe, Africa, and, and America. So, yep, we've got a few people on board today. We'll get going, I think. Let's get this cracking. There's a few webinars coming up in the future. You can see that I'll deal with this more, in more detail later, but there's six or, or so webinars there and some online courses we're running. So please look into that. Well, I'll mention them again later. The presenters today are Andy Lucas and Ben Keel. And I think they're joining us as we speak. Yep, there's Ben. Uh, Andy's coming as we speak. That's good, Andy. Yep, great to see you. Andy's Managing Director of AJ Lucas Constructions. He has 40-year uh, experience in the um, pipeline drilling industry in the US and in Southeast Asia. Well known, uh, well known as a long-time committee member and former president of the uh, APIA and been elected to the president of the International Pipeline and Offshore Contractors Association in 2016. But Andy is so well known in the gas extraction and gas uh, development and design industry, a real mentor. Uh, ben uh, is from Aris Water, director at Aris Water, completed his PhD at Central Queensland University, 20 years experience in the water industry, researched, built and operated a wide, wide range of treatment facilities, water treatment facilities, and a recognised leader in the management, treatment and beneficial use of wastewater streams. He's developed, patented, successfully commercialised two treatment technologies. We're absolutely Glad to have um, uh, people of your caliber, well, people with your experience uh, with us today, and thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, before we get started, maybe I'll just, Ben, if you say a few words, Andy's going to take the first presentation, but if you just have a few words to us now, uh, Ben, that'd be great. Oh, well, I'm very glad at this poll that you've just put up there, seeing I'm going to be focusing in a lot on water management. 88% yeah, yeah. of the audience thinks yeah. that water management is a fantastic topic to have a look at so i guess you feel fairly important now really oh, looking at oh i do uh, andy's <laughs> going to have a focus in on what's going on in the northern territory in shale gas i'm going to have a big focus on water management particularly with coal seam gas or coal bed methane if you're used to that terminology from north america so welcome That's to everybody right. and yep. uh, we're all ready for andy to kick off kick off with andy over to you andy and um, looking forward to hearing what you have to say uh, and look, before Andy gets cracking, make sure you ask questions, make comments on, either on the Q&A or put your hand up and we'll, uh, we'll see that happening and uh, bring it up on screen uh, at the pro appropriate moment. But let's make this as interactive as we can, shall we? Over to you, Andy. Hey, thank you very much, Trevor. Thank you for the opportunity to give this presentation. I have to start by saying that uh, when I first got involved in this gas extraction business, my mother said to me, it sounds very interesting, but for whatever you do, make sure you protect the water. So here we are looking to protect, still looking to protect the water. She knows what she's talking about, Andy. She's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Over to you. Thank you. So, so this presentation is discussing the uh, hydraulic fracturing report that was issued by the Northern Territory Government's inquiry. So the agenda that I was looking at is, is the uh, taking takeaway messages, the opportunities uh, to do with LNG export because they are enormous. What is shale gas? The size of the shale gas resources. What is hydraulic fracturing? Water supply issues raised in the inquiry. Wastewater issues raised in the inquiry. Water treatment issues. And my conclusions to all of this. My conclusions might be a little bit... Um, a little bit emotional, but th they are my conclusions. There's no doubt about the the uh, report says the risk for the hydraulic fracturing may be mitigated or reduced, in some cases eliminated altogether to acceptable levels with good engineering and following the 135 recommendations made by the by the panel. Water must be protected. The emphasis is not to use surface water, only to use underground water, but we don't know how much there is or where it is. Produced water must be examined and treated before it's reused or disposed of. This means treatment of salts and hydrocarbons when generated in the rocks, naturally occurring radioactive salts as well. I think the report is a bit misnamed. 
of the 135 recommendations, only six are specifically to do with fracking. The rest is to do with social licence and the development of gas wells and not the science of fracking. So I've made some changes to the front cover of the report, so I think it's fit because I don't think it is a... Although the scientific part of the inquiry is excellent, only a small part of the inquiry is to do with science, in my view. It's about development of new gas industry, not about hydraulic fracturing. So I'm disappointed to read that. And my questions are, will the 129 social licence and gas well development requirements, requirements make this $3 billion a year project unbankable? I think that's a question that we need to think very carefully about. Australia's LNG export out of Australia is now our third largest commodity. I just put this in uh, uh, to show the context of this. So 52 million tonnes a year of LNG worth $22 billion a year. So we're talking about a lot of money in the existing LNG exports. The Queensland coal seam gas is different from shale gas, but it has grown rapidly in the last 15 years. There's been $70 billion worth of investment in the three LNG plants in Gladstone. According to the graph there from Energy Source, is worth $1.2 billion a year. And we have this, the coal seam gas from Queensland is 8% of the world's global LNG trade. And China is taking half of it. The growth in LNG exports, you can see Australia has leapt ahead and is leading the world and will continue to lead the world in LNG exports. So what is shale gas? So shale gas is not coal seam gas. I've shown you a sample of coal, which you see we're familiar with, where the cleats are very well formed, whereas shale is brittle. It's really, we call it shale, but it is more, it's got a large amount of silica and uh, carbonates in it, so it's very brittle, and it needs to be brittle for it to be able to frack. There are no pathways in the shale, so it's necessary to create pathways by hydraulic fracturing. You can see that it's, it's a source rock, this is source rock well below the sandstones. We tend to think about oil and gas being in sandstones, but they don't originate there. They only accumulate there, and they come from source rocks such as shale. Such as, uh, shale. See, COVID methane is much shallower, you see on the left-hand side, and has its own difficulties because it's so shallow, whereas a shale is, is up to 2,000 to 3,000 metres deep, which places it well out of harm's way. So we have substantial shale reserves in Australia. The US Information Energy Administration says we've got the sixth largest shale oil resource in the world, the seventh largest shale gas resource in the world. My argument is we should be doing something with it. So this is a map from the inquiry about the known prospective source rocks. And the table is also from the inquiry, talking about Origin, Sandos and Pangaea as to how many worlds that they predict would be in a development program. If I multiply that by $8 a gigajoule, which is the price, average price for LNG, you can see on the previous graph, we're talking about $3.7 billion a year potential. I think $3.7 billion a year is a lot of money. And I think that uh, the people of the Northern Territory would like to see some of that, would like to see a lot of it, would like to see any of it. But the way they're heading, I'm not quite sure they're gonna get any. So what is hydraulic fracturing? So the shales are source rocks and the oil and gas originate within the shale. The oil and gas are absorbed in a free state in the pores of the rock. To give the gas, gas oil pathways in the well bore, the rocks have to be artificially fractured. That's done by injecting water, mainly water, 99.5%, and sand, which is used to keep the fractures open once they're created and inoffensive kitchen detergents at high pressure, typically 9,000 psi, 600 atmosphere. The shell needs to be highly brittle for the fracking to work, and horizontal bores are drilled through the shale and fractured horizontally. The water requirements are significant, so for a typical horizontal well, you need typically 10 Olympic pools of water. So the water requirements are quite significant, during the fracking pro pro process. Now, hundreds of thousands of worlds have been successfully hydraulic fractured around the world and including Australia. The water supply is used now with this comes to the nitty gritty of what this seminar is about. 
So a lot of water is needed for fracking, fracking, and there must be enough water for everyone, including farmers, Aboriginal people, plants and animals. And the inquiry calls for changing the laws so the gas companies have to pay for the water they use. It seems fair enough to me. I'm, I guess uh, most people would agree with that. It predicts that the gas industry would use between 2,500 and 5,000 megalitres each year in, this, in the Beetaloo sub-basin. That's almost 2,000 Olympic swimming pools a year of water. It sounds a lot, but on the scheme of things, when you see how, consider how much rain does fall in the north, northern part of the Northern Territory, it really isn't such a large amount. The inquiry goes to significant, significant um, stress that port surface water, like lakes, rivers, streams, and billabongs, must not be used for fracking water. One of the problems here is when they're talking about fracking, they mean drilling oil and gas wells as well. And they say that groundwater should be used instead. And the recommendation is that use of all surface water resources for any onshore shale gas activity be prohibited. But the problem is we don't really know how much groundwater there is, which way it goes, how much new water comes in, who uses it, and before we take it out of the ground. How long will this take? The inquiry says big studies over big areas must be done to help us learn about groundwater. So the question is who pays? Who's going to pay for that? I can't see the developers paying for the big, big studies that are required. And the inquiry also says good plans and laws need to be put in place to ensure the water is properly managed. There's enough for everyone, which is fair enough. I can't see a problem with that. The graph shows a, how much uh, recycled water could be used, could be used compared to how much new water needs to be found to be able to carry on operations. I don't think there's any particular questions about water supply issues, but it's very important for the industry, very important for the local communities, and very important for the industry. Might be a good point to pause uh, and ask if anyone's got any questions they'd like to uh, put up to Andy. David, you've got a comment to make. I can see that your um, window is open. There we are. Are you there, David? Yeah, I'm here. I'm just really questioning that one because um, having had experience of uh, seeing sort of shale operations uh, across sort of North America, um, particularly in Pennsylvania, you know, it was sort of full on recycling. It was just the way of doing business there. So, you know, okay, we need to characterize the water uh, to ensure that we can actually uh, recycle the stuff. But um, certainly, um, I don't particularly would sort of hold to the view that you can't recycle straight up. I mean, Beach have been recycling in the um, in the Minka area with their um, uh, frack jobs there. So um, I would sort of support the notion that we need to go in fully thinking that we are going to start recycling from day one. Yes, I, I, don't, I don't know. I think I may have miss, miss, um, I didn't think I said that, but of course they would recycle from day one. There we go. Yep, yep. Yeah, can't yep. get on screen there, Dave. Now, thanks yep. you. So, yep. I've been a mistake about how, Any comments on that, Ben? Oh, I think it's more that the number of wells, that on that graph you've got to have a significant number of wells going down before the recycled water volume begins to, to, to show itself. But um, David and Andy are both right. Recycling the water, particularly in shale, will start from the word go, and they'll try and recycle that water multiple times. And the industry, it used to be able to recycle water four times before it became too contaminated. Then it got to six, now it gets to eight. And a lot of the water treatment focus in on um, shale gas water treatment is increasing the number of times the water can be recycled as far as drilling new wells and increasing the operation. I just think on that particular graph, it's a lag time for the number of wells to start going down before the recycled water volume begins to, to show significantly. Yep, okay. Yep. That, that's good, David. Then um, there's a couple more questions coming up here, but we want to also move on with uh, Andy's uh, presentation. Hugh Middle Middlemiss has made a comment. That be the Beetaloo Basin, hi, Hugh. Thanks for making a comment, by the way. The Beetaloo Basin Geological and Bioregional Assessment, uh, assessment Study is in progress. 
and will provide info on groundwater resources and the cumulative impacts of the development and the water use. But he's not sure of the time scale, but I expect it will be completed within one to two years. It's, it's, a, it's a comment and um, may be useful for a discussion as we go through here. Okay, I think we'll address that in a few minutes. All right, no worries. But thank you very much, Hugh. Thanks, John. Thanks, uh, and Jeff. As Jeff Hales has got one. We'll we'll come back to those questions in a minute, um, people. If you just just uh, stay with us, it'll be great. I'll back over to you again, Andy. So wastewater issues are very interesting. So the report uses these words: when water comes out of the world, there are bad things in the water. But then, so I read bad things as contaminants. The inquiry also says that merely because a chemical is detected in a flow back or produced water does not mean it will be harmful to human health or to the environment. It goes on to say that contaminated bad water should not be packed, put back into the ground or rivers or dams or in the ground. This is fair enough. The bad things they talk about are additives in the drilling fluid, brine produced from the formation, and chemicals that originate in the shale formation itself. These include salts, metals, metalloids, organic hydrocarbons, and naturally occurring radioactive materials, depending on the chemist, geochemistry of the deposit. The inquiry says the government and gas companies need to get a good plan to get rid of the waste and wastewater. Until the wastewater can be removed, it must be stored in closed tanks. I certainly agree with the need to have a good plan to get rid of the waste and wastewater, but just storing it in closed tanks sounds like a pretty dead end solution to me. And I can't see anybody spending the money on developing a well if they think they're going to have to store it all in closed tanks and there's no plans in place to do anything else. There also needs to be plans in place to make sure that none of the bad water spills anywhere. So we'll see later on that the American study said that there's really no issues of, of wells, um, fracking water being a problem down the hole. It's a problem with fracking water which is badly handled on the surface. So spillages, and the inquiry looked, spent a bit of time looking at ways of bad water from fracking can get into the groundwater and how it can be stopped. Said they go on to say it's very unlikely that gas and bad water can leak to the surface because of the very big distance between the shale and the groundwater. There's two to four kilometres. The special way the special cement and steel are used in the construction of the well. The spools of bad water can contaminate good water, water, especially in the wet season and rainy system season. This problem can be fixed with using strong storage tanks and ongoing checking. Worlds need to be made such that gas and bad water do not come out of the worlds, especially when they're old. And it's a very good point. And the worlds need to be checked to make sure we know they don't leak. The inquiry says that everyone needs to know what chemicals go into the worlds and what chemicals come out of the well. They go on to say that in 2016, the US EPA collated data from thousands of worlds that have been drilled and hydraulically fractured in the past 10 years. He concluded there's no evidence of any widespread impact on shallow aquifers, no demonstrated cases of contamination of drinking waters, water resources from hydraulic fracturing at depth. However, they did identify cases of drinking water contamination from spills of fracturing fluid or flowback water, the contamination of aquifers as a result of failures of well integrity during and after hydraulic fracturing. So that, that says to me that we need some really good engineering, and I have no truck with that. Being an engineer, I fully support that. This slide is a little bit dramatic, but it, 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 it comes out of the report in which they say how wastewater might contaminate. There might be leakage path of hydraulic fraction fluid, but that really, it's through abandoned wells, but that hasn't really happened very much, that I, that I know, according to the US EPA. Contamination of shallow groundwater through fractures by, by the induced fracking process, but we're talking about thousands of metres here, and we've demonstrated in the past that just the simple calculations of the energy wave is impossible for that to happen. Surface pools of chemicals, that's fair enough, we've discussed that. Surface pools yeah, flow within the well pad as it's washed off-site to a water body, which means care is needed. 
re-injection of untreated water in deep aquifers, a fault reactivated induction of seismic activity, the possible opening up of the communication pathway to the surface, the disruption of surface flows. I, I don't believe that there's a communication pathway that can be caused at that depth, but it is certainly possible to reactivate some, to lubricate some faults and that happened in the UK. <coughs> Excuse me, please. A direct discharge of treated waters to surface waters, overtopping of failure wastewater storage ponds for spills during transport of chemicals. So I think they're all fair enough, but they really got not, not, not much to do with fracking itself. So wastewater treatment issues, flowback water contains a diverse range of organic compounds. The biodegradable organic compounds can be treated in purpose for biological treatment plants is inquiry. And, uh, and Ben will be able to explain much more of this to you than I can. Suspended solids can be removed quite, quite readily. Conventional oil for water treatment technologies such as reverse osmosis, they're suggesting uh, really not, ne not necessary and that electrocoagulation is a better result, cheaper and better result. But there are no answers to what to do with the contaminants once they're removed. No answers whatsoever on that. So it's sort of a, a, it's, it's a, it's, it's, it's a pass, but without an answer. So wastewater disposal, there's some confusion and contradiction as I read the report. It says wastewater needs to be stored in tanks, but no answers as to what then. The recommendation 7.17 is that prior to the grant of any further exploration approvals, the discharge of onshore shale gas hydraulic fracturing water, treated or untreated, to either drainage lines, waterways, temporary stream systems and water holes be prohibited. Now I think that if you can treat the water, I, I don't understand why it can't be put back into the ecosystem. I just don't understand it. If you can treat it satisfactorily. Since companies should not be allowed to put water that's already been used for fracking back into the ground after they've taken the bad chemicals out. So they're saying don't reuse the water, which is opposite to what I understand as a view in Queensland, where they would like the Great Artesian Basin to be recharged with treated water. But in other places, the report does say that treated water can be returned to the, to the groundwater, so I'm a bit confused. The report implies, but doesn't, specifically say so that evaporation of wastewater is an answer. The rainfall of daily, water, daily waters is 635 millimetres a year and the evaporation rate is four times that. So it would seem that evaporation is a good idea but then what do you do with the salts that are left over? Recommendation 5.5 .5 is that prior, prior to the grant of any further exploration approvals in consultation with the gas industry and the community the government develops a wastewater management framework with volumes and volumes in nature of the wastewaters. How long is that going to take? Why isn't it in the report? Why haven't they addressed this in the report? There must be an audible chain of custody for the transport of uh, wastewater, fair enough. In the absence of any treatment disposal facilities in the Northern Territory of Wastewater and Bryant produced by the gas industry be addressed as a matter of priority. I would have thought it should have been addressed in the report, but it hasn't. Any questions about my being a bit too aggressive about all of that, or unfair, or? I'm no. sure you've got a I, I don't think you're being too aggressive or unfair. Yeah, it, it's always a difficulty where a report has a recommendation or a conclusion that there should be another report. I, th I think you're putting it on the table as you see it. Let, let's have some discussion about around mm -hmm. that as we go through. No, I think it's good. Healthy. Okay, so, so my conclusions after reading this report, are, and the report is excellent. Sci the scientific aspects of the report are really excellent. I think they've done a great job. Maybe that's because it's been done by the CSRO. But I think the scientific aspects of the report are terrific. I don't like the political side of the report. And there's a lot of politics in the report. So we're talking about a three, we've shown that this could be a $3 billion a year project. Question is, is it bankable? Is it got a lot of good science, but it's highly politicized? The report says there must be no physical work for five years with significant non-technical social license restrictions. 
So if we get about this project for another five years, and then the companies, it says, well, the companies will do their planning in the meantime. They won't do their planning in the meantime. No one's going to bank a project where you don't have these answers. The report says we must look at how the project affects the whole region. A five-year-long study of land, water, local community is needed. And to define what are the benefits to the local community with their agreement. Who's going to pay for those five years? See, the report says we must not use surface water. As I've said that, and use groundwater instead. <coughs> we need to know how much groundwater there is, where it goes, before we can take it out of the ground. But we don't know where it is. So there's a significant five year study to figure out how much water there is and whether you can use, which areas you can use the water and where you can't do any drilling because you don't have access to water. It says all produced water must be treated as disposed of by injection, underground, or evaporation. No water, however well treated, to be used on the surface. No, I just, I just can't believe that. That's you're trying to tell me that in today's, today with the, with the treatment for treatment technologies we have, that you can't make good use of this water. I think it's ridiculous. They say the absence of any treatment disposal facilities needs to be addressed. Well, how many years is it going to take to set up some treatment disposal facilities? And how far are you going to have to truck this stuff? It says people who might be affected by the gas industry should be able to go to court and have a judge listen to their problems. As I read it, this is ex exercisable at any time during the life of the project. So who's going to spend all this money, get a license from the government, and then have somebody rushing off to court to have a judge listen, judge listen to their problems? Uh, it's, just, it's just not sustainable. It also makes a very strong point of saying the gas companies are guilty until they prove innocence. I don't think that's very reasonable. It also says there must be no net increase in life cycle greenhouse gas emissions emitted in Australia from any offshore shale gas produced in the end. So therefore you can produce the gas but don't burn it. So I'm pretty, pretty not too happy with the report, frankly. And that's my position. So I'm happy to happy to like say yep. about it. Yep. Yep. Now that's great. Look, I appreciate the the thoughts you've brought here, and they've come from a deep and a, a long understanding. So no, thanks very much. There's a ton of questions coming on here. So maybe we'll just kick off. Uh, ben, should we kick off with Sayed's question from the USA? Uh, over to you, Sayed. Uh, oh, hello. Yeah. This is uh, Sayed. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, webinar. Uh, I have a question regarding the. Uh, groundwater contamination if there is no any um, industrial contamination only uh, the uh, the city discharge to the river uh, without any um, treatment uh, is there any possibility that uh, the shallow groundwater also contaminated and there is any effect on the deep groundwater because in the city which we are leaving uh, I'm uh, talking uh, uh, regarding the Kabul city in Afghanistan, the shallow groundwater has been exploited too much because there is no surface groundwater utilization for the drinking water supply. Uh, but uh, that city is not that much developed in terms of the industrial, industrial development. It's only the, uh, the city discharge to the river. Uh, how uh, much uh, this effect on the shallow groundwater? Is there any effect on the deep groundwater because that's our strategic uh, uh, groundwater that we can use for the future. Ben, can you, I, I, that broke up yeah. a little bit for yeah. me. Yeah, the confining layers generally stop the deep aquifers from being contaminated from the most common forms of contamination with unconventional gas, which is spillage. So if there is a spill around your gas wells or transporting spills or pipeline spills with the water, that tends to uh, interact with the um, shallow groundwater and the, the natural water courses, the rivers, the streams. But the confining layers protect the, the deep aquifers as far as protection there. But generally, the deeper you go with the aquifers, the more saline that water is and its usability for drinking water and for agriculture becomes less and less the deeper you go. No, thanks a lot. Thanks a Thank lot you. for that question, Sayed. What what state are you in uh, in USA, Sayed? 
Uh, I'm, I'm studying. I'm studying here the master course. Oh, see. And what, what USA uh, uh, city, what, what state? Uh, in California. California. Oh, yeah, that's lovely. Yeah, I understand your question did relate uh, to Afghanistan, but uh, mm -hmm. you're in California. Yeah, that's very good. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's great. There's a ton of questions going on here, so maybe we'll get stuck into these right now. Or should we go to Ben to do your presentation? I've first? been having a look at some of the questions which are coming through. Thanks. <laughs> My presentation yep. will actually answer some of them. Okay. And I'll... Um, We'll try and actually get some of them into the uh, presentation. Presentation. So, yeah. All right. Now that sounds good, Jeff, uh, John, David, Stephen, uh, Ian, Millet, uh, Hugh, um, Hang Five. We'll just we'll, we'll do Ben's presentation and come back to you. We're still aiming to to sit in about one hour. Oh, hopefully, we're we're up to um to, we're up to thirty five minutes now. So we're still travelling okay. All right then. Well. Over to you then, Ben. Righty ho, Trevor. And thanks very much, Andy. That was absolutely great. Stay with us. I'm going to be focusing mostly in on the CSG, but I'll make comments with shale water as, as we go. And uh, I'll be having a look in at the most common contaminants which are present in the water and some of the ways to treat them and uh, be able to reuse the water. So why are we having a discussion about the unconventional gas industry to begin with? It is a fossil fuel, but it actually has a, a lower greenhouse gas emissions. And it's something that we're using to tr transition away from coal. And if you have a look at this graph here, this is actually looking at how we're transitioning with our energy supply. You can see that gas is beginning to march, you know, increase in a big way. And we've got water, wind and nuclear up the top there as far as renewable energy. I managed to really, really depress myself when I was um, researching these slides because um, the peer-reviewed scientific journals which are talking about how long it's going to take us to transition away into renewable energy, they're not talking about 2030 goals or 2050 goals. They're saying the process is going to be between 50 and 75 years for the world to transition away. Developed countries going a lot quicker than developing countries, but we are going to need transitional energy sources for a lot longer than some of the uh, political statements that you hear or read about in the in the newspaper. So uh, yeah, a transitional energy source like gas, which has a much lower greenhouse gas emission than burning coal or wood fuel or food and fodder is uh, particularly important for us to have. So co-produced water. This water which is coming out of the gas wells, and this is with the CSG, has environmental issues. Salinity, sodicity, some elements such as strontium, fluoride, boron, barium, uh, radioactive salts that we've talked about there before. And the majority of these contaminants of concern are naturally present in the water. They are not something which has been added in by the people who are extracting the gas. And the cost of this treatment is much higher than the value of the water. Most of the recycled water, the treated water, which is produced by the Australian gas industry is sold for farmers for reuse for token amounts like a dollar a megalitre. For all sense and purposes, the Australian gas companies are giving this water away for other people to use. Um, I should mention here that the coal seam gas industry tends to be a net producer of water, that you actually get more water out of the wells than what you put in to drill the wells and to operate the wells. Whereas things like shale gas, that's actually a net consumer of water. So where Andy was talking a bit before there about where the groundwater is going to come from as far as being able to uh, drill the wells without having any access to surface water, that's really important in the shale gas industry because it's a net consumer of water. Whereas with the coal seam gas industry or the coal bed methane, if you're from anywhere else other than Australia, that produces megalitres of water um, as a waste product. So we're having a look at, at produced water production outlooks. This is one of the more recent graphs that I've been able to find. You can see that North America is producing the bulk of produced water out of the unconventional gas industry in forecast as far as billions of barrels between now and 2020. Australia is increasing. We're getting more, um, but we're very much uh, a small producer of uh, produced water compared to what's going on in other parts of the world. And for our industry, that's not a bad thing. We've got plenty of opportunity to have a look at what's going on overseas, what's working, what's not working, 
uh, and looking at improvements in the industry. And we can really um, get advantages from, uh, yeah, lots of R&D money being spent in North America in particular, improving treatment technologies and being able to import them into Australia. So produced water, every gas company would prefer it's not there, right? They don't sell water, they sell gas. Um, and we tend to model uh, our produced water on a whole range of different modeling programs and but there's a great deal of uncertainty involved with how much water that we're going to get out and the industry itself isn't static the drilling techniques are being improved all the time and <clears throat> over the last 10 years i've definitely noticed that the new drilling techniques the horizontal bores <clears throat> being able to link wells together we're getting a lot more gas out and a lot less water than what some of the earlier models did predict this is a very classic produced water volume in the coal seam gas industry graph. It's been around a long time. When you first drill the well, you get a lot of water. As that well dewaters, your gas increases, right? And that's a fairly simple looking graph when you have a look at that. And um, yeah, it's useful to a point. This is some of the mathematics that goes behind that graph because wells, they don't just are drilled the once and then left alone. You have workover crews going through wells. You've got maintenance going on wells. You have other wells that go down <coughs> in uh, drilling programs that roll out across the, the gas field, which will have an impact. So it's not a static thing. And when you look at that, that's you know <coughs> not too bad. But this is some of the calculations which goes behind that. And the whole reason I'm putting up these fairly bulky slides is that um, it just goes to show that where we start modeling what's going on, there's a, a fairly famous saying that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And where we're putting down these new gas fields and we're trying to determine how much water is going to come out, we make a prediction, but sometimes that prediction can be really wrong. Such as the blue line here is the modeled production on how much water they thought was going to come out on a particular <coughs> series of gas wells. And the green line is what actually came out. So you can see here that um, <clears throat> while the models are useful, um, they're not always right. And it's very important to go through and do ground truthing on your models. And you've also got to make sure <coughs> that whatever water treatment capacity that you've got set up and water recycling schemes can handle a great deal of variation. And this is important in the gas industry. Because if you think about if you were modeling the water coming from San Diego or London or Melbourne or Sydney, um, you don't get this level of variation in the volumes of recycled water coming from a major municipal city. And that's where we've had the biggest history of our recycled water industry. Because we're going into a gas field and the volumes of water are going to change markedly <coughs> over the years as the gas wells age, as new gas wells go through, as work over crews go through, whatever treatment system you devise and whatever water recycling scheme you have, you've got to be able to handle variations in flow and in water chemistry as well. And so this actually makes <coughs> calculations such as mass balance on how many kilos of salt or tons of salt or tons of strontium or fluoride or whatever you've got to treat, it's going to be complex. And that means that your water treatment technology, it has to be robust and reliable. So you're putting in multiple barrier approaches. So instead of just having a simple reverse osmosis unit, you might need ion exchange, you might need hydrocyclones, you might need ozone equipment, all to handle the variations in flow <coughs> over the course of generally 20 years that you'll have a water treatment plan installed in a particular gas field. So this not only makes the engineering difficult, it also makes the regulation of what's going on difficult as well. This is having a look at some of the uh, <coughs> relationship of CSG water production compared to the number of wells. So you can see the number of wells is really going up and that's in line with Andy's talk where he was talking about the volume of gas <coughs> really being increased as far as being exported <coughs> from Queensland. And you can see that that shot up. You'll notice that the water volume of water is actually beginning to taper off and that's the impact of some of those improved drilling techniques that I was talking about earlier. CSG water quality. <clears throat> this is a slide with a whole heap of information on it. 
all I really want you to get from this is that it's incredibly variable. If you have a look at the salinity here, which is the electrical conductivity, between 4,000 and 13,000 for those 54 wells, 3,500 and 9,500 for these 73 wells, 5,000 and 17,000 for these 23 wells. And this level of variation is not something that we get in many other types of water treatment around the world. So being able to sit back and design a reverse osmosis, because if you think about your, your RO treatment plants, your brackish water down here at 3,000 to 3,500, but you're very much getting up to seawater concentrations at the higher concent uh, at the 17,000 electrical conductivity. Then you've got things like SAR, which is very important, the sodium absorption ratio. If you're looking to irrigate that water onto a clay soil, in Queensland, generally the irrigation values for SAR are between four and six. So you can see them starting off there at 70 and up to 177, 86 to 160, 62 to 156. To get that down between four and six, you're looking at a fair adjustment to the uh, number of cal calcium and magnesium ions which are in that water compared to the sodium. <coughs> so the, some of the other contaminants of concern that we have, uh, yeah, boron, which is actually toxic to plants, and it can be toxic to plants at these concentrations. Iron, which will interfere with your RO membranes, so will calcium and magnesium. Barium and fluoride are also, you know, 3.2, 3.3, 2.7, you're getting above Australian drinking water quality guidelines and having to remove fluoride. So, and strontium. Um, <clears throat> if you're over in the United States, arsenic is one of the major uh, heavy metals of concern with uh, CSG and coal bed methane water. Whereas here in Australia, it's more strontium that tends to, to get up in concentrations. When we're having a look at water treatment technologies, this is having a look at how they've <coughs> matured over basically the course of the last 10 years. And you can see where things such as um, electrodialysis were up at the lab scale at 2000. 2012, sorry, and now they're beginning to move into more mainstream, and Andy was talking about the Northern Territory report, talking about electrodialysis and electrocoagulation actually becoming more and more mainstream. So there's plenty of different technologies which are used in the uh, treatment of produced water, and the whole reason why there's these different technologies used is going back to that variation in the chemistry that I was talking about there before. So when you're designing a water treatment plant, you've got to look at your volumes, the minimum, the maximum, the average, your inflow water chemistry ranges, the level of treatment which is required, and where you're going to dispose of concentrated contaminants. And this is a bit where I'm getting back into the agreement with Andy there with the, the um, closed tanks in the Northern Territory. So salinity is one of the major contaminants of concern. A lot of the other ones we're talking about milligrams per litre with but whereas with salinity, we're talking about tons of salts per megalitre of, of produced water from both the shale gas industry and the CSG industry. And there's all different types of salinity, but once you start getting down to these threshold electrolyte concentrations, that's when you're beginning to have major environmental concerns where you're disposing of this saline water onto soils or into freshwater streams. And the only thing that takes salt out of water is money. Right, you can do it with membranes, you can do it thermally, you can do it with iron exchange, but sodium salts in particular, you need to have a large amount of money and a large amount of energy to be able to get that out. <clears throat> and this is a risk management approach, having a look at some of the coal seam gas water reuse in um, southwest Queensland, and you can see an awful lot of red on here as far as risks, and the majority of these risks are related to where the salt is going to go in the system because there's no such magic places away. If you're evaporating all the water away and you're left behind with a solid product, such as <coughs> that salty waste, it's not just going to be a pure table salt that you can sell on. It'll have strontium salts in it. It'll have fluoride salts in it, arsenic salts in it, barium salts in it, some radioactive salts. So where is all of that going to go away? Um, there was a question there about what happens in, in developing countries and even in developed countries. If you can do it with deep well injection or ocean discharge, 
Those two are, are quite common and the major reason they're used is because they're relatively cheap. Zero liquid discharges, <coughs> which is what's been recommended in the Northern Territory, that's considered to be quite expensive. And if we head over to this one here, we can see surface water discharge accounts for about 45% of brine discharge across the world. Sewer disposal, which basically ends up back out into the, uh, into the ocean, is uh, around another quarter. Deep well injection, to be able to pump that brine back into a much, much deeper aquifer uh, requires a large amount of energy, is quite expensive. But evaporation ponds and zero liquid discharge worldwide only accounts for about 7% of brine management. And the whole reason for that is that, it, yeah, one, that you need good evaporative conditions or you need an awful lot of money and energy to be able to get to zero liquid waste. And even then, that brine's got to go somewhere, the solid salts. Here in Queensland, a lot of it's been um, <coughs> shipped into old abandoned underground coal mines and uh, sealed up a kilometre or two underneath the earth. So that's me, Trevor. That should almost be my five minutes. That is absolutely brilliantly done. The last few slides, you did really well. And we have a ton of, a ton of questions coming on board. Thank you, everybody. Uh, from uh, Australia, Norway, India, uh, uh, Tanzania, there's a, there's a quite a few to look at here. And maybe if I could just ask uh, Ben and Andy, if you could just scan some of these questions and, um, and maybe pick the eyes out. And we're not going to get through them all in the, in the eight minutes we've got left to, yeah. to meet the one hour. Um, but Ian, it is naturally occurring radioactivity. It's not radioactive, any radioactive materials right. that have actually been put into the, the uh, well drilling process or anything. <clears throat> so, yeah. That's great. Yeah, Ian, get down Ian that Michael. deep, you will get naturally occurring radioactive particles and the water's giving it a pathway to come back up to the surface. That's great. Yeah, but let's get straight to it. Yeah, that's Ian Marshall from the UK, Bristol in the UK. Thanks very much. Uh, that's great. Um, I noticed one here from, um, well, Hugh Middlemiss makes the point, a good point, that the Beetaloo Basin Geological and Bioregional Assessment is designed in part to help advance projects that will increase the availability of gas on the east coast of Australia. I think this is a pretty, pretty pithy comment. Thanks very much, Hugh, for making it. It's not a question, it's just a comment. This means that it should be much less than five years before we have the info to support decision making on project development and environmental assessment. That's a pretty, pretty hefty statement and one which takes a bit of thought. Um, maybe we can, we can leave it as just a comment at this point. Do you think, uh, Ben, okay with that? Some of, the, some of the questions here are, are talking about how can the water be recycled. Um, as I said here, we've got a couple of water treatment plants out there treating unconventional gas water, and the water's being recycled in, in a variety of ways. Uh, stock are being watered, uh, crops are being irrigated, some of the water's going back into the um, use with drilling of, of new wells. Some of the water's being used by the work over crews where they go back to old wells right. and basically clear out the well lines. Um, some's being used for dust suppression. Others being used for uh, the traditional coal mining industry as far as being able to wash uh, coal fines of coal being exported. Yep. And, and <clears throat> you know that, that's what water treatment plants that I'm involved with are doing. Others, uh, the water's being discharged into um, irrigation dams and being shandied with um, natural irrigation water. So, and um, you know, here, here in Queensland, there's uh, some which is being re-injected down into aquifers as well. So, <clears throat> but the, the bulk of water in Queensland, I would actually say, is, act is being um, recycled at the surface. But there is very little um, coal seam gas water, which is being treated and discharged into natural waterways. Yep, yep. Um, I, I, one of the things that we really wanted to differentiate in, in this webinar was the, the, the way we treat uh, water, uh, shale um, gas extraction, the way we treat CGS uh, gas extraction. They're quite different, aren't they? I mean, one's very deep, shale is very deep, and, and C, CSG is not so deep. But what, what are the water considerations in each one of those? Have we differentiated between shale and CSG in terms of the water issues and the environmental issues? Yeah, well, significantly different, yeah. So shale gas water tends to be much more saline 
and it's a net consumer of water. So you've got to bring in water from somewhere else to actually right. make up the, the volume to keep drilling your wells and keep your activity going. Mm. Coal seam gas water, the water is from much higher up. Yep. Uh, well, coal seam gas is extracted from much higher up where there's uh, much bigger aquifers, much more available water. Um, but typically it's below the shallow aquifers which are used for um, farming and for um, drinking water purposes. So the water is saline, um, but nowhere near as saline as what shale gas water is. Shale gas water can be oh, anywhere from five to ten times as saline as seawater. Yeah, right, right. So because of that much, much higher salinity, you're looking at different treatment techniques. You yeah. tend to go into thermal rather than membrane treatment. Uh, electrodialysis, electrocoagulation, <coughs> but it also really depends on what other contaminants are of concern yeah. are, are there in the water. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons why you have to be very specific to the gas lease that you're working in. You can't just cut and paste a treatment chain from one location and put it somewhere else because the right. groundwater chemistry might be very, very different. Yeah. So you, for this type of industry, you tend to design a specific water treatment chain for the exact location that you're in. Yep. Um, and also you, you try and make sure that you've got two or three water recycling options or dispersal techniques for your treated water at the end, because um, that's part of your risk management. You never know when one's going to, uh, you can't have all your eggs in one basket. So if you were putting all your water towards a coal mine so that it could um, wash off coal dust, what would you do if that coal mine shut up shop? Um, you've got to have other options lined up and ready for where that water goes. There's a question in here on what's the average cost of treating CSG water in Australia. I, I did notice um, that. Yeah, it's thousands of dollars. So water in Australia per megalitre, depending on where you are, you can buy it from maybe $500 to $1,000 a megalitre. The treatment cost of CSG water in Australia would be between five and $10,000 a megalitre. Mm -hmm. And um, you'd sell that water typically to a farmer or a reuse project for a token dollar a, yep. a year. Yep. Yep. So it's got a high treatment cost and it's got uh, a very low value after it's been treated. So that was Rezvan's question from Iran. I uh, can't yep. imagine what, what time it is there, Rezvan, but thanks for joining us. That's good. Yep, that, that's great. Can you see any others on here which we should, we cannot deal with all of these with the one minute remaining? There's about the techniques for addressing the high level of uncertainty, multiple yep. barrier approaches, and you get grey hairs yep. in your body <laughs> and through the sides of your head. Have you been dying? You try and think about everything that you can possibly do, um, but uh, you also put flexibility that if you need to add another treatment technology, in your um, treatment chain, you can with the minimum of fuss. I see why Andy's got grey hair and you've got darker hair, Ben. You've been dying and I can see that. It gives you grey hairs, but you get around that. You, you, you cheat. Oh, you no, the grey's <laughs> coming through. <Trent. laughs> hey, um, are we going to have to call it quits? Oh, I'm I absolutely really sorry, Bjorg and Milit and R R Ravindra, David, Stephen, Jeff. I apologise to everybody, the whole world. Milit. Thank you for your questions. I really do. We really do appreciate them. But we're going to have to call it quits. We've hit the one hour mark. So any closing comments from yourself, Andy, or yourself, um, uh, Ben? ben <laughs> Thank you today. all very much for your attendance and the questions coming through. Yep. And um, yeah, if you've got any specific questions, feel free to email them through. Yep. You can email them to, to Trevor or find me online. I'm sure we'll be able to answer them for you. And thanks again, Andy. Any other closing comments from yourself, Andy? No, I, th I think I've been pretty uh, outspoken as it is. <laughs> That's as it should be. It only it only helps to be on the table. We we can deal yeah, with issues my, on the table. My wife went to a speaker's course one time, and they <laughs> told her to not to be outspoken. She said, "Outspoken by whom?" <laughs> yeah, it's right. By who? That's exactly right. Well, thank you both, gentlemen. That's absolutely fantastic. Everyone, don't forget to, to do the feedback form. We'll, we'll send you a, a link to the recording. There's six free webinars there with you might be interested in in groundwater and 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 managed aquifer recharge from mining and a whole lot of other areas which um, we'd like to interest you might be interested in. And there's some online courses. Don't forget to use the Twitter handle at ice underscore warm underscore and you'll hear everything that's going on here in ice form. 
once again, thank you everybody. We'll call it a day for um, the science of hydro hydraulic fracturing and hope to see you again soon. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Andy. Thank, thank you, you very much. Yeah. Joel. Thank you. Yep. Bye for now. Bye.